Hello, everyone. In this lecture, we are going to study about a condition that is known as pure red cell appletion. So what is the basic difference between aplastic anemia and pure red cell appletion? In aplastic anemia, all the lineages were affected. But in pure red cell appletion, only, only the erythroid lineage is going to be affected. So there, is, there will be halting, there will be halting in the process of erythropoiesis. Okay. So only these patients will have anemia, other cell lines will be normal. Of course, these patients will have lower ET count because the erythropoiesis itself is defective. Now let us see what are the etiologies or what are the causes that can cause this condition. Among the congenital conditions, one of the most important disease that we have to remember is diamond black fan anemia. Okay. So the first is diamond black fan anemia. So this is a condition which is associated with pure red cell aplasia. So diamond black fan anemia. This condition is grouped under ribosomal biogenesis disorder. Okay. So the most commonly mutated gene is RPS19. Okay. We'll discuss this more uh, about this in subsequent slides. So the most common uh, gene that is mutated in this condition is RPS19 that helps in the process of ribosome synthesis. Okay. We'll come to it. Now let's see what are the other causes. Among the idiopathic causes, one of the important conditions you have to remember is TEC, transient erythroblastopenia of childhood. So this is transient. erythroblastopenia of childhood. Okay. This is a condition. We exactly do not know the cause, but it is hypothesis that some of the unknown viral infections trigger some, some uh, kind of immune response against the erythroid progenitors and that will cause halting in the process of erythropoiesis. Okay. And of course, there are so many conditions, so many uh, cases of PRC, pure red cell aplasia, where we do not know exactly what is uh, what is the exact reason. So many of the cases of PRC are actually idiopathic, absolutely idiopathic. And one of such conditions is transient erythroblastopenia of the childhood. Then there are certain malignancies. And the most important malignancy that we have to remember in this context is thymoma. Okay. So thymoma, we'll discuss it later about thymoma. But remember, thymomas can be associated with PRC. Thymomas can also be associated with myasthenia gravis. Okay. What are the other malignancies? There are certain blood malignancies like large granular lymphocytic leukemia, large granular lymphocytic leukemia, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. These malignancies can also be associated with pure red cell ablation. Then there are certain drugs like phenytoin. We have discussed that phenytoin can also cause idiosyncratic type bone marrow failure. So it can it can also be associated with aplastic anemia. It can also cause pure red cell appletion. Phenytoin, then uh, sulfonamides, sulfonamides, azathioprine, and Recombinant erythropoietin. Recombinant erythropoietin, it is used commonly in patients with chronic kidney disease. With the current preparation, we do not see much of pure cell aplasia, but the preparation that was used originally, many times these patients will develop antibodies against the erythropoietin. Okay, erythropoietin is the protein, is the glycoprotein, which helps in the process of erythropoiesis. So if the patient develops antibodies against the erythropoietin, now that will cause halting in the process of erythropoiesis. So that, that can also lead to pure red cell aplasia. Okay. And there are certain infections, but uh, most important infection that you have to remember is Parvo B19. This we have discussed multiple times previously also when we discussed about hemolytic anemia. This Parvo B19, uh, Parvo B19 in patients with hemolytic anemia can cause a plastic crisis okay, by attaching to the P antigen present over the erythroid precursors. Okay? So these are all the important causes which can cause pure red cell aplasia. Okay. So among the congenital diseases, it is the diamond black and anemia that you have to remember. Among the congenital uh, diseases, it's the diamond black and anemia. Then idiopathic, one of the important conditions is transient erythroblastopenia childhood. 
Among the malignancies, thymoma is the important one to remember. But apart from that, large granular lymphocytic leukemia and CLL can also cause. Among the drugs, phenytoin is a drug that can cause both aplastic anemia in an idiosynthetic or dose independent manner. It can also cause pure red cell aplasia. Apart from that, sulfonamides, azathioprine, and recombinant EPO. It can be sometimes associated with PRC. And among the infections, parvo B19 is important. Okay. Now, among all these conditions, now we'll discuss a little bit more about diamond production anemia, transient erythroblastopenia of childhood, and parvo B19. Okay. And rest of the etiologists will discuss, I mean, uh, especially the malignants, we'll discuss in separate sections. Now, let us discuss about diamond production anemia. This is a condition that you are going to find in patients. I mean, you are going to find in infants. Okay. So, laced in one year of age. And I told you, this is actually a ribosomopathy. Ribosomopathy. Or you can say it's a ribosomal biogenesis disorder. That means there are certain proteins which are involved in the process of ribosome biogenesis. They are mutated. Okay. And one of the important mutations is RPS19. RPS19 which is found in around 25% of the cases of diamond black and anemia. Okay, it is found around 20 to 25% of the cases of diamond black and anemia. Now, these patients, along with pure red cell aplasia, they will also have some phenotypic abnormalities. Like this, you can see this is actually a triphalangeal thumb. It's actually a triphalangeal thumb. Triphalangeal thumb. Okay, this is just one example. They can have various other anomalies. They can have cranio facial abnormalities cranio facial abnormalities they will have this thumb abnormalities thumb abnormalities and they can also have urogenital abnormalities urogenital abnormalities for example heart stroke kidney okay so various phenotypic uh, abnormalities can be seen in these patients they can also have cardiac defects okay they can also have cardiac defects now, how, what will be the morphology of the RBC? I have told you previously, whenever there is a marrow failure, whenever there is a defect in the bone marrow, usually the RBCs that you are going to get in the peripheral blood, they will have a higher MCV. So you will have macrocytic RBCs. You will have macrocytic RBCs. One, and one of the peculiar point is, RBCs in these patients, they will express, they will express the I antigen. They will express the I antigen. I hope you remember where we have discussed about the I antigen. Actually, I antigens we have discussed when we discussed about the uh, when we discussed about the uh, cold agglutinin disease. Okay, so RBCs in these patients will have increased I antigen expression. Hemoglobin F is increased in these patients, and erythrocyte adenosine deaminase levels are also increased. We do not exactly know why these things are increased in patients with DBA, but these are increased and they help in uh, making the diagnosis. Okay, so this is erythrocyte. Erythrocyte, adenosine, adenosine, D aminage, adenosine D aminage uh, play a role in, in the salvage pathway, in the salvage pathway of the pyramid synthesis. Okay, so these are the important points about diamond plaque and anemia. So basically, these patients, these children, these infants, they will present in their, sorry, they will present in the infancy that is less than one year of age. Most important mutation is RPS19. It's a ribosomopathy. They will have pure, pure red cell aplasia along with some phenotypic abnormalities. Important ones are the craniofacial abnormalities, thumb abnormalities, urogenital abnormalities, and cardiac defects. You are going to get macrocytic RBCs. You are going to get macrocytic RBCs. And there is increased expression of IE antigen. Hemoglobin F and erythrocyte adenosine deaminase levels are increased. Okay, so these are the important points about diamond black fan anemia. Now, now we see a little, uh, see a little bit about the transient erythroblastopenia of thyroid because many times this question is asked: How can you differentiate diamond black fan anemia from transient erythroblastopenia of childhood? From the name itself, you can understand this happens in the childhood, but this happens beyond one year of age. So that is the first point of the difference. Diamond black fan anemia happens in less than one year of age. But TEC happens more than one year of age. Again, it's a transient condition. Transient condition. So it is usually self-limited. Okay. So it is self-limited. We do not give any treatment. This is self-limited. 
but diamond plaque anemia we treat these patients with glucocorticoids we treat them patient treat these patients with steroids then we'll see the other points preceding viral illness yes this is a very important uh, clue uh, for the patients with pec so as i told you in this condition there may be certain unknown viral infections that has happened previously and now uh, the body's immune system against this uh, viral uh, against this virus can actually attack the erythroid precursors okay so tc is usually associated with a preceding viral infection but that history you are not going to get in patients with dba phenotypic abnormalities seen in patients with dba but not with tc sbf levels and erythrocyte adenosine dmnh levels as i told these are increased in patients with dba but these are normal in patients with tc okay so these are all the important points points of difference between dba and tc so dba is less than one year of age this is more than one year of age preceding viral illness is seen in tc not in dba phenotypic abnormalities seen in dba not in tc hemoglobin f and erythrocyte adenosine dmn levels are increased in dba but not in tc treatment for dba is glucocorticoids or steroids and we do not treat tc because that is a transient self limiting condition okay so once this is clear now we see the infection that is that is causing prc that is parvo b19 okay now parvo b19 the first point is it's a viral uh, it's a dna virus it's a dna virus it can cause a very benign condition in children that is known as fifth disease that is known as fifth disease or otherwise known as the slab cheek appearance slab cheek appearance okay fifth disease or slab cheek appearance as you can see here this child is very happy because it's a very benign condition and it is also a self limiting condition but it can cause pure red cell aplasia in certain group of individuals especially they can affect the fetus sometimes they can affect the fetus and in fetus if they if it is causing pure red cell aplasia in fetus that will lead to severe anemia and whenever the fetus have severe anemia there will be congestive cardiac failure okay and because of this con congestive cardiac failure there will be organomegaly and there will be fluid overload and so that condition is known as hydroxyphetalis that's that condition is known as hydroxyphetalis okay so this is the same concept that we have discussed for four gene alpha deletion so four gene alpha deletion can also cause hydroxyphetalis similarly parvo b19 if it is affecting the fetus and causing pure cell aplasia that will cause hydroxyphetalis and intrauterine death they can also affect patients with chronic hemolytic anemia do you already know and also they can affect the immunocompromised individuals like hiv like hiv or post transplant post transplant patients post transplant patients in these two in a group of patients it can cause a plastic crisis it can cause a plastic crisis in patients who have hemolytic anemia in those patients immunity is normal so many times it is actually self limiting and uh, the infection will result uh, with time on its own but in patients who are immunocompromised this uh, infection can persist and it may not completely resolve because they do not have the immunity to act against this virus okay now if you see the exact mechanism this also we have discussed previously this is a precursor erythroid okay precursor erythroid and it is expressing an antigen that is known as p antigen okay so this is p antigen this p antigen can be identified by the parvo b19 and with that it, it will gain access into into the into this erythroblast into this pro erythroblast okay and after going into the erythroblast it will it will proliferate inside the inside this cell and they, it will call, it will uh, stop the further uh, maturation of this erythroblast okay and usually if immunity is good like in patients with hemolytic anemia it will resolve in one to two weeks but if the immunity is not good it the infection is going to persist okay and if you do the bone marrow biopsy if you do the bone marrow biopsy we are going to classically see this giant pro normal blast giant pro normal blast or you can say pro erythroblast giant pro erythroblast and you can see the viral inclusion inside the giant pro erythroblast so this is classical this is diagnostic for parvo b19 this is otherwise known as the lantern cell lantern so okay so these are the important points about parvo b19 infection okay and if it is not resolving the treatment is ivig if it is not resolving on its own treatment is intravenous immunoglobulin
Okay. Now, you just uh, an idea of uh, about the treatment. So the first thing is you have to treat the underlying cause. If you have an underlying cause, as I have discussed previously, if you have an underlying cause, for example, if it is due to diamond platinum anime, you give them shorts. And if it is due to drugs, you have, you have to stop the drug. And if it is due to infection, you have to treat the infection like, like that. Or, or if it is due to malignancy, you have to treat the malignancy. So you have to treat the underlying cause. That is the first thing. Second point is many of these cases are self-limited. Okay, as I told you, transient uh, erythroblastopenia of childhood, many of the parvo, mean antinylated PSA, those are self-limiting conditions. You, uh, you need not do anything. But there are some specific situations where you have to intervene. For example, if the patient has thymoma, if the patient has thymoma, you have to go for surgery, you have to remove the tumor. If it is due to recombinant erythropoietin antibody related PRCA, you can treat these patients with plasma extens. Okay, so these are all important points. If it is due to parvo B19 and, and if it is persisting, then you have to treat it with IVIG. And many of these cases are idiopathic. We do not know exactly what is the cause. In those patients, we treat, treat those patients with immunosuppressive therapies. Immunosuppressive therapies, especially cyclosporin is a drug. Cyclosporin works really well in these patients. Cyclosporin works really well in this patient, but there are many other immunosuppressive therapies that can also be used. Even the immunosuppressive therapies that we use for aplastic anemia can also be used for these patients. Okay. So these are all the important points about the uh, pure itself aplastic. So read the underlying cause. Many conditions are self-limited. If it is due to thymoma, go for surgery. If it is due to antibody against recombinant EPO, you can do plex plasma extens. If it is due to persistent parvo 19 parvo B19 infection, you can give or you can give IVIG intravenous immunoglobulin. If it is idiopathic, you can give immunosuppressive therapy. Okay, so that is all about pure red cell ablation. Now coming to the last section, that is other forms of bone marrow failures. The first thing is first one is myelopathic anemia. First one is myelopathic anemia. So myelopathic anemia means here there is a space occupying lesion, space occupying lesion in bone marrow, space occupying lesion in the bone marrow, which is interfering with the normal erythropoiesis, which is interfering with the, I mean the normal hematopoiesis. Okay, so there is a space occupying lesion. That means there is something abnormal that is going into the bone marrow and it is interfering with the process of hematopoiesis. Now these abnormal cells, it can be malignant cells. Like for example, in patients with CA breast, CA lung, or CA prostate, carcinoma breast, carcinoma lung, or carcinoma prostate. Now these malignant cells that can metastasize into the bone marrow. Certain granulomatous diseases can also go into the bone marrow, and this condition is also seen in spent phase of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Okay, so this myeloproliferative neoplasms we will discuss separately. Now, these are certain conditions which can actually invade the bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, they can actually cause fibrosis. In the bone marrow, they can cause fibrosis. And because the bone marrow is fibrosed, now whatever cells are there in the bone marrow, usually in the bone marrow, you are going to, you are going to find the precursors, uh, erythroid and myeloid lineage cells. Okay, so you are going to find the uh, precursor cells of hematopoietic lineage. And now what, now what will happen? Once the bone marrow will start getting fibrosed, these precursor cells, these precursor hematopoietic cells, they will start to come out to the peripheral blood. They will come out to the peripheral blood. So what you are going to get in the peripheral blood, if precursor erythroid series lineage is coming, you are going to get the uh, nucleated erythroblasts. You are going to get nucleated erythroblasts and sometimes these are known as the nucleated RBCs. So you are going to get the nucleated RBCs or the erythroblasts. Similarly, you can also get the immature granulocytes immature they are also also going to get the immature granulocytes immature granulocytes they, these include the myelocytes metamyelocytes the band forms and also the promyelocytes okay so immature granulocytes we are going to get in the peripheral blood similarly one more point you, you, you can also get that is if the bone marrow is fibrosed, if the bone marrow is fibrosed, when the mature, when the RBCs are trying to come out, or you can say that when the reticulocytes are trying to come out of this fibrosed bone marrow, they'll take a peculiar shape. And that peculiar shape is something like this. So this is known as tear drop RBCs. So you are also going to get the tear drop RBCs. Okay. And whenever you find all these things in the peripheral blood, like nucleated RBCs, 
immature granulocytes and tear drop RBCs. This condition is known as LEVP. What is this LEVP? This is leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Leukoerythroblastic, leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Okay. Of course, if the bone marrow is fibrous, there will be decrease in production of the hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, I mean, the decrease production of the hematopoietic cells. And so ultimately, these patients will have cancer to penia. And if you see the peripheral smear, you are going to get this leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Okay. So this is known as myelopsisic anemia. If you can see in this peripheral smear, you can see, you can appreciate that this is a teardrop cell. This is also a teardrop cells. Teardrop cells are otherwise known as the drapenocytes. Drapenocytes. Okay. Uh, this is this is actually a nucleated erythroblast. I mean nucleated RBC, you can say this is a NRBC. NRBC. This is a immature granulocyte. This is actually metamylocyte. We will discuss the morphology of this metamylocytes, myelocytes in a different lecture when we will discuss about the WBC uh, defects. Okay. So these are the things we are going to get in lipoerythroblastic blood blood picture. So what is myelopsisic anemia? Myelopsisic anemia is a space of pain lesion inside the bone marrow due to various conditions like some carcinoma, granulometastasis, or strained phase of MPN. Now that will cause bone marrow fibrosis that will halt the normal process of uh, hematopoiesis and it will also release the precursor forms of hematopoietic cells into the peripheral blood like nucleated RBCs, immature granulocytes and also because the RBCs are trying to uh, squeeze, uh, squeeze themselves out of this fibrous marrow, they will take this tear drop cell that, that is known as the drepanocytes. And in the peripheral blood, we are going to get the slipo erythroblastic blood picture. Treatment of this condition is to treat the underlying disease. Okay. So if it is due to malignancy, you have to treat the malignancy. If it is due to some granulomatous disease, you have to treat that condition. Okay. So this is about the myelopsisic anemia. Now coming to the next one. Next one is anemia in patients with chronic kidney disease. In patients with chronic kidney disease, actually it is multifactorial. Anemia is multifactorial. Okay. The most important one is decrease in erythropoietin production. As we already know, erythropoietin is produced in the peritubular capillaries inside the kidney. So whenever there is CKD, these patients will have reduced erythropoietin. Okay, reduced erythropoietin. Apart from that, they will also have, if these patients are associated, if it is associated with chronic inflammation, many times if these are associated with chronic inflammation, that will cause increased interleukin-6. Increased interleukin-6 will cause increased production of hepcidin. So all these things can actually cause anemia of chronic disease, anemia of chronic disease. Apart from that, whenever there is uremia, uremia, whenever there is uremia, I mean, this CKD patient will have increase in uric acid and uh, uh, nitrogen products. So that is known as uremia. Whenever there is uremia, there will be reduced RBC lifespan. And also these patients will have abnormal platelet function. Because they have abnormal platelet function, it can cause bleeding. It can cause bleeding. That can lead to iron deficiency anemia. Also, these patients are Cachectic, these patients will have decreased appetite, they will have poor oral intake. So, they will also have nutritional defects. They will also have nutritional defects. And these nutritional defects can cause decrease in iron, which also contribute to the iron deficiency anemia. And also, they will have decreased vitamin B12 and folic acid, which can cause the megaloblastic anemia also. Okay. Another mechanism is, in patients with CKD, there is defective calcium absorption. So, defective calcium reabsorption. Because of that, these patients are going to have hypocalcemia. Whenever they have hypocalcemia, they are going to stimulate the parathyroid gland. They are going to stimulate the parathyroid gland. And now, this is known as secondary hyperparathyroidism. So, patients with CKD can have secondary hyperparathyroidism. Okay. They can also have tertiary. Those things we will discuss later. But most importantly, they will have secondary hyperparathyroidism. That is due to, that is due to hypocalcemia. Okay, and the secondary hyperparathyroidism can cause bone marrow fibrosis. It can cause bone marrow fibrosis. Bone marrow fibrosis. This bone marrow fibrosis will again it can it will it will reduce the process of hematopoiesis. Okay, now these are various factors which can cause this, which can cause anemia, which can cause anemia in patients with CKD. Okay. But the important ones are anemia of tonic disease and nutritional deficiencies. Okay. One last point I want to tell about this condition. Uh, in, in patients with CKD, 
in peripheral smear you are going to get this kind of cell that is these are known as the bar cells these are known as the bar cells otherwise these are known as the echinocytes okay so bar cells or echinocytes echinocytes e means these are evenly distributed spikes over the rbc membrane so these are evenly or regularly distributed spikes over the rbc membrane as you can see here you can see here and these are small small spikes evenly distributed and this is reversible also okay so this is reversible reversible small evenly distributed spikes are known as bar cells or echinocytes but this is not specific to this condition we have also discussed that in patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency and whenever there is a prolonged storage of the blood that can cause artifact so sometimes slight artifacts can also cause this condition due to prolonged storage of the uh, of the uh, sample blood can also show this condition. So bar cells, or is known as echinocytes. Pyruvate, uh, it, it is also seen in pyruvate kinase deficiency and also it is seen in side artifacts. So these are the three important causes you have to remember for bar cells or echinocytes. Okay. Then coming to the Last slide, another condition is anemia in hepatocellular diseases. In hepatocellular diseases, because of you know a decrease of function of the liver, most importantly, whenever the patient have uh, liver cirrhosis, it, it will always be associated with portal hypertension. So liver cirrhosis is associated with portal hypertension. These things we'll discuss when we discuss about the liver pathology. But they, these patients will have portal hypertension. And whenever the patient have portal hypertension, they will also have esophageal varices. They will also have splenomegaly. Esophageal varices and splenomegaly. Esophageal varices can cause GI bleed. It can cause GI bleed. And that can cause iron deficiency anyway. Splenomegaly can cause splenic sequestration. Or you can say hypersplenism. Hyper. Splenism. What is hypersplenism? Hypersplenism means increased activity of spleen, so it will pull up all the blood cells from the circulation. So it can cause actually pancytopenia. So splenomegaly can cause hypersplenism, and in that process, it can cause anemia. Also, <coughs> these patients, uh, whenever you have a, a liver disease, these patients will have severe anorexia. Severe anorexia will cause reduced food food intake, and that will cause nutritional anemia. Also, it will cause nutritional anemia. So these are the various mechanisms why patients with liver disease can develop anemia. Apart from that, whenever the patient has a liver disease, there will be abnormal phospholipid and cholesterol metabolism that will cause increased phospholipid and cholesterol deposition in the RBC membrane. So this will cause increased volume of the RBCs, increased volume of the RBCs. So these patients will have increased MCV. Increased MCV, that means they will have macrocytic RBCs. So in patients with liver disease, we are going to get a macrocytic RBCs. Okay, that is the first point. Second point is they can also develop a peculiar type of cell, peculiar type of RBCs. These are known as the echinocytes. Sorry, these are known as the acanthocytes. These are the acanthocytes or otherwise known as the spur cells. We discussed in chronic kidney disease, you are going to get bar cells or echinocytes. In liver disease, you are going to get acanthocytes or spur cells. How it is different from the echinocytes? These acanthocytes, they will have irregular spiny projections, which are irreversible. Okay. As you can see, these are irregular and these are spiny projections. Echinocytes, we have regularly spaced, uh, even I mean evenly spaced small, small projections, which are reversible. These are irregular spiny projections, which are not reversible. Okay. However, this is again, this is not specific for hepatocellular disease. This can also be seen in patients with a beta lipoproteinemia. A beta lipoproteinemia. And also vitamin E deficiency. Vitamin E deficiency. We'll discuss these conditions later in different section. But remember three important causes of echinocytes and three important causes of acanthocytes. Okay, liver disease, A beta lipoproteinemia, and vitamin E deficiency. Okay, remember three is three important causes. So acanthocytes, this is seen in liver disease along with that A beta lipoproteinemia and vitamin E deficiency. Okay. And they will also have this macrocytic picture. Okay. Then uh, the last one is 
uh, there are various endocrine conditions which can cause anemia. But one of the important is hypothyroidism. Anemia in hypothyroidism is multifactorial. Okay. And uh, most of the times they will cause normocytic, normochromic anemia. But apart from this, there are various other endocrine conditions that can also cause anemia due to various causes. But again, I'm not going to discuss all those things. Just remember the most important one is hypothyroidism, which is going to cause normocytic, normochromic anemia. Okay. So that is all for this class. Thank you.